good experienced clients know that putting quality above cost is going to give them the best value project in the end. Episode 170. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with Tim Bell, Harry Phillips, and Melissa Dowler, the directors and co-founders of Bell Phillips Architects, who are based in E1W down in Wapping, one of my favorite bits of London, and they have developed uh, an incredible expertise and specialism, if you like, in the world of social and affordable housing. They've done a lot of public work. Uh, they've been involved in some fantastic uh, pavilions, uh, and recently, as they've worked on uh, educational institutions and educational buildings. But really, they've made uh, an incredible mark in the architecture industry with their work around innovative housing. In this conversation, we talk about how Tim and Harry founded the practice and what sorts of challenges a younger practice might be facing now if they were to follow the same route. The main crux of this conversation today goes deep into public procurement, some of the constraints about public procurement, but most importantly, the power of doing public work and why it's important for architects to be engaging with it. And we get some real deep insight into how we can approach tenders, bids, framework agreements, and how to structure uh, practice profitability around doing this kind of work. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Tim Bell, Harry Phillips, and Melissa Dowler. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Tim, Harry, Melissa, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you all? Good. Thank you for having us today. Yeah, great. Good, good to see you. Absolute pleasure. So you are the directors of Bell Phillips. You guys are based um, in East London in Wapping. Um, you've got a really amazing portfolio. You're one of the practices that's kind of um, rose to prominence in quite a large part with social housing, public sector work. And, you know, that's really kind of your bread and butter, if you like, which is quite unusual in many ways for an architecture practice to be uh, so focused on housing, but it also gives you guys a very deep understanding of the issues that surround delivering that kind of work and the complexities that are involved. Um, you've got some extraordinary projects, Granary Square, Pavilion, um, the Mitchell Building, so you've been working in education as well. I know you were finalists in the BD Housing Architects uh, last year. You've won a number of RIBA awards, so the Mitchell Building has been quite successful there. The South Park, uh, Southwark, is it South, South, Southwark? Southwark. 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 The South, yeah, the Southwark Pavilion that won the Wellbeing Prize for the NLA. So strong, amazing portfolio of work, very interesting sectors that, you're, that you've chosen to focus on. Um, and I guess the first question is perhaps you could explain to us how did the business begin? What was the, I know you was, it was a competition yeah, win should to I start with. kick that off? Um, yeah. It was um, that Harry and I met as part twos at a, a London practice, um, became pals, and um, decided that we might have a have a go at a competition. And so we we'd known each other for four or five years, and um, thought we'd, we'd we'd have a go. So the first one that came up was a housing competition. It was a regeneration of a low rise housing estate for Newham Council, called the Brooks Road Estate. Um, in East London and uh, we sent in our submission and were surprised to be shortlisted and went to the interview and at the interview we said to Newham Council, you know, you do, you do know, don't you, that we're just a couple of guys having a go, uh, you know, we'd love to work with you but we're not a practice and they, they were positive and said, you know, that, that's fine um, and, and we, we got lucky and we won the competition which was amazing that Newham uh, 
were confident to give a couple of guys that project. It was about an £8 million regeneration. Um, and, and they said, if you can get a business set up within a month, then the job is yours. So uh, that's how it happened. And that's how we got into housing, because we hadn't worked in housing before. So housing and public sector housing, that was, that was the beginning. So was this a, 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 in a time pr uh, like before framework agreements and extensive, um, you know, they're doing their over the top due diligence that we see nowadays that kind of prevents this type of innovation from young young starters, if you like. Yeah, it's the last thing. It's the last thing you want, isn't it, to have some young innovative architects like doing some social housing? It sounds like a terrible <laughs> idea. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it certainly does feel like a, a, another time in a way. I mean, it was a design competition, so pure design competition, right. RBA um, organized, uh, led competition. Um, and yet, to be honest, thinking back, that was 2004, it does feel slightly like a different time to the sort of mm. slightly uh, heavy procurement systems that we have today. Um, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. So we were talking about this um, just the other day and, and, you know, whether or not, the practice could have started again now, you know, because the same, because we couldn't repeat that. Um, obviously, I wasn't working with Tim and Harry at the time, but, you know, you think a lot of what's happening in procurement now, um, particularly in the public sector, there's a huge amount of emphasis on being very, very careful with how they procure in order to encourage, for example, um, equality and diversity and inclusion in terms of procurement. But actually maybe the system in some ways has gone too far the other way because actually yeah. a little upstart company or two people just coming out of their part two probably couldn't win a job now. I mean, you know, unless you're kind of backed by another larger firm um, because you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the case studies, you wouldn't have the relevant experience, you certainly wouldn't be able to tick the social value boxes that we're asked to do. Um, so there's a, there is an interesting question there about um, would companies like ours exist? What what do you think are some of the challenges that exist for particularly younger practices? And, you know, kind of if we were to take this example of if you guys were to start again today, would it, you know, what would be the first things that would be getting in the way of winning projects? And again, this kind of opens out onto a broader question of the, the challenges overall of, of procurement and the impact that it's having on delivering good quality housing. I, mean, I think it's the lack of track record, which is the first thing. You can't go and see a client and say, you know, believe in us because we've done this. Look what we've done and we've been trusted before. You, you don't have that. So, and I remember we won that first competition and that was great. But beyond that, when we were looking for further projects, you know, project number two, number three, uh, we really had that problem. It was quite a few years before we built one or two things and could, could point to them and, and show that, that people could have confidence in us. And the irony is it doesn't just affect small practices starting out. Like, you know, we have a fantastic pedigree in housing and particularly in social housing. Um, but, you know, recently in, in the last sort of half a decade, we've been branching out. You know, we've done our first schools project. We've done more and more um, kind of public buildings in terms of our pavilions and things. But time and time again, we do bids for you know frankly relatively small scale pieces of work but in a sector we haven't done before you know mm -hmm. whether it um be kind of offices or commercial or, or something where we don't we just don't have the same track record and actually you can't get past go necessarily with um a lot of the procurement and i think you know um i think that's potentially really detrimental across the industry you know i think the kind of cross-pollination cross of ideas you know um, from one sector to another, okay, yeah, we, you know, we don't have a track record in health. I wouldn't expect someone to give us a hospital, but you know, actually, a community centre or sort of, you know, community spaces or offices and things, not dissimilar to the education projects or community mm -hmm. projects we've already done, you know, but just slightly different sector. And, and I think having a kind of in the same way, actually, when we try and hire staff. We don't necessarily just look to hire from the other housing architects we know in London. You know, I think sometimes it's really interesting to get staff who've worked in wholly different sectors and come to housing with a very new and fresh perspective from what we have currently. So, you know, I think that cross pollination is really important.
And, and on that, I mean, I think Tim mentioned that um, we hadn't done housing before we won that first project. <clears throat> um, I, I think, I think also uh, social housing had become, to my mind, quite stale at that point. There was the same mm -hmm. sort of quite big um, housing firms that were sort of dominating the affordable housing market, um, and we sort of. Uh, you know, we came from working on West End um, office buildings and master plans. We brought a completely different perspective. We wanted to sort of bring that kind of quality to the social housing, affordable housing sector and couldn't really understand why people weren't weren't doing that and innovating and doing interesting things. So, so we, you know, we brought a new perspective, I think, to that sector. And there are other people, of course, that are doing that as well. But I... Um, but it's also worth noting that the project manager who um, who, who backed Newham, who advised Newham for that first project and backed us um, in being a very young practice starting out, has has gone on to become one of our biggest clients sort of down the years. So taking a bit of a punt on a fledgling practice, I think, has paid dividends, um, hopefully for Newham. I hope they, they agree with that. But also, you know, we've established ourselves and, and um, uh, Barbara Brown, leader's client, has sort of seen the benefit that we bring to projects that perhaps other practices don't. What was the the kind of impetus behind developing a focus or an expert an, an expertise in housing? Was this always a kind of philosophical position that you, as architects, wanted to uphold your sort of civic responsibility, or was it a business decision, or I think, how did that think, how did it emerge, or was it I all just kind of I think there's a degree, degree of alignment between um, sort of chance and and us. We, we, we didn't set out from the, the outset with a sort of manifesto, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to go into this sector, and we're targeting that. And there was a degree of um, chance in the fact that Tim and I, you know, as Tim says, it happened to be the first competition we did. We happened to win it. It, it, it projected us into a completely new sector, a completely new sphere of architecture. Um, so that, that happened. But then the other thing that happened simultaneously was that um, local authorities were being released by central government to spend their own revenue from rents. And it just so happened that at the very moment that we got a public sector project with Newham was the very moment that local authorities and public sector started developing again on quite a big scale. And we started um, phoning up local authorities and saying, um, you know, well, we've done this project. Do you, do you mind awfully if we come and talk to you about it? And they'd be like, yes, please come and tell us how to develop our small sites and, and build housing. So there was that sort of, sort of serendipity. But at the same time, I think what we've come to realize is that, you know, it, it's not entirely by chance that we work predominantly in local authority sector and, and do a lot of work. I think it's partly the fact that it chimes very well with our own values. And whilst we didn't write those down and set those out at the outset, I think, you know, we do care about having impact on community, um, social value, uh, impacting on people's lives. I think we do, you know, the sort of we don't, we don't we have that as a core value, each of us. And it happens that we chime very well in that sector. From a, a business standpoint, um, I know working with public or local authorities has its own challenges in terms of you know fee expectations and negotiations can be quite tough or sometimes there'll be you know people put in place in the procurement process whose sole job it seems sometimes is to ensure that the architect's fees are kind of kept within a certain range how do how do how have you managed to grow and develop a successful business within these kinds of very tight um goalposts if you like or are they not as tight tight as i might imagine i mean i don't think you know i mean we've worked we don't work uniquely in the public sector we do also mm -hmm. work with private clients and developers and it, frankly, it depends on the developer. You know, there's some private developers who don't pay as well as local authorities, some that pay better, certainly kind of thing. So I wouldn't say particularly that working in local authority um, sort of absolutely defines you as kind of sitting within a certain bracket in terms of right. fees. And, and I think that, you know, part of it is just actually a bit what Harry was saying, that you get experienced at knowing how local authorities work. And I think, you know, if you were 
an architect with the same kind of pedigree and history as we had, but in the private sector, and you were to suddenly work in the public sector having never worked in it before, you probably would find it quite hard to make it stack up and make it work. I think, you know, we tend to go in with our eyes open now. We understand um, things like, you know, timescales within the public sector, but also how milestones and sign-offs work within the public sector. And we know how to resource our projects internally in a way that's quite light-footed um, and allows for the fact that, you know, let's be honest, local councils, you know, have a lot of kind of internal processes that mean they're not necessarily as fleet of foot as you would be in the private sector and you have to allow for that and potential downtime in projects and then, you know, pauses. I mean, I, su I suspect in many ways it's similar in the private sector, but in, you know, more led by the economics at a given time. Um, so I think, you know, we know how to work with public sector clients. We understand kind of the nature of the beast, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. And also we've been doing it for quite a long time, you know. Um, I think we know how to lead the projects, to design leanly and to concentrate, focus the design on the areas where it really, really matters. You know? So I think I'm going to, yeah, I'd agree with that. You know, we've learned to work more efficiently uh, and yeah, focus our time where it matters. Um, so that's the sort of downstream bit. I think the sort of upstream bit in terms of procurement and trying to negotiate a fee. I would love to be able to have a conversation with a public sector client and negotiate a fee. And um, it, it's never like that. It's always a blind bid of some sort um, where you pitch with a fee to some percentage of the mark and quality to another percentage. But I think the only other way we approach that is we might ideally pitch for public sector work where we know the clients and we know that they are keen to work with us and uh, and they know us. I think where we've had less success is where we're pitching to an authority where we don't know anyone because it, it does sort of come down to human relationships to, to a degree. And also that we only try and bid for work where quality is measured more highly than cost because we, we can't operate in a, in a race to the bottom kind of bid. We can't be on absolute bargain basement fees if we're to produce mm -hmm. our best work and, and do what the very best work that the client needs us to do. So, uh, and without putting undue pressure on our staff and so on. So we do have to draw the line somewhere. Um, and those bids that are measured more highly, as I say, on quality are the ones that we tend to focus on. And, and also increasingly, as we've become uh, a little bit more well-known, we've been invited to more selective bids increasingly. So a, a smaller number of bidders where our chances are slightly higher, and that's been useful. But there's a sort of unspoken um, checklist, isn't there, of, of when we're looking at um, bids and weighing up whether they're worth our while, we'll be looking at do we know the client either personally or as a as a borough? Um, how big is the project? Is the is the size of the project worth the outlay of the bidding process? And, and how how sort of convoluted or lean is the is the bidding process? Um, what is the uh, what is the sort of track record of the local authority? Have they delivered quality? Is there sort of um, can they demonstrate? I mean, not they're asking to demonstrate, but have they have they delivered quality in the past? Are they sort of look like the sort of client that we'd like to have? Um, but also in terms of you know how how um, wide are they casting their net in terms of asking for bids? Um, is it a framework of eight people or ten people? Is it invited or is it a framework where you've got you know? Is it completely open and you've got maybe potentially 100 or 200 people um, looking to bid? So um, un unspoken or not, these are the sort of thought processes that go through our head when we're looking at um, the bid process. So you're in a in a way then you you're qualifying the client to make sure that it's a it's a fit for you as much as they're they are doing it. Definitely, on, on absolutely, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll be reading the brief and saying, you know, have have they allowed? Is it a well written brief? Have they allowed for enough yeah. program? Is their construction budget does it look reasonable? Yeah. You know, does does the number of homes they're talking about for the site look reasonable? So yeah, I mean, we're we're sort of we're pre qualifying them as much as they're pre qualifying us. Certainly, I think that yeah, there's like just a series of red flags aren't there yeah. you know um and if if too many of them are raised then we walk away sometimes we might ask for some clarifications 
you know, and occasionally we'll take a punt, even when we think there's a few red flags, if we just think it's a really mm. interesting project mm. or a client that we really want to get in the door with, um, where we think other interesting things might be coming our way. But generally it's, it is pretty easy to tell. Um, and yeah, the, the quality to cost ratio is always an absolute given. Yeah. Right. Partly because also, frankly, good experienced clients know that putting quality above cost is going to give them the best value project in the end. You know, I think this this constant, you know, like the triangle um, diagram that you, you learn in part three, um, quality cost time, you know, and, and recently a lot of people have been saying actually in terms of where we are as a society, that needs to become a square and include sustainability as well. But mm-hmm. But even just talking about that quality cost time diagram, it's really divisive because actually you shouldn't be saying, well, actually, if you do something that's high quality and takes time, it's definitely going to cost more because we should be looking at whole life costs, which is where the sustainability comes in. You know, if you look at actually, if I take the time to design something that is of high quality and considers, you know, the whole lifespan of it, then in the long run, over 60 or 100 years, it's going to cost our client and the planet significantly less. And I think Mm -hmm. good clients understand that. But I think, yeah, the people that maybe aren't on that page are some of the procurement people in in the local authorities, and and clearly they're trying to achieve best value for money, um, which very often is a financial value. But uh, I think we'd like to see, as Melissa says, a more holistic thought process on some occasions where, you know, an architect's fee that might be 10 or 15 percent more more, um, might look unpalatable um, to a procurement officer. But actually, that architect might be more creative or more able to negotiate with the planning authority to get, you know, X number of more homes on the site or produce better value in so many other ways or the long term uh, commercial value of the project could be could be infinitely higher, and I think we feel that you know placing too much value on fee cost at a bid stage is is not the best way to actually give um, an authority what what they really do need. But I feel like that penny is starting to drop though. Um, and go, again, going back to sort of you know when we started with we this open design competition, it was you know a relatively lean process. <coughs> We've gone then into a sort of a much more um, sort of unwieldy procurement process. But I, 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 and to a certain extent, we're still in that. But I do think that local authority clients are starting to understand that cost is not the driver, that actually, you know, the, the value, the design quality that you bring is the, the driver. And of course, they have to get value for money. But I, I sense there's a much better appreciation of what value means rather than just focusing in on the cost. Yeah, there's, it's very interesting how, you know, this, there's always this kind of, uh, I don't know if conflict's the right word, but, you know, trying to negotiate or, or, or help a client understand the long-term versus the short-term impacts of, you know, initial investment versus long-term lifetime costs of a, of a building. Um, interesting, you, you were mentioning there about, you know, kind of being more upstream and developing relationships with local authorities um, first. And I've spoken to a number of architects in the past who have sort of have discussed strategies where in, you know, they, they, they're looking to become conversation partners rather than service providers, right? So they're interested in, in developing a conversation or a dialogue with a client before the bid or the tender goes out because often at that point of going to bid or tender it's almost a little bit knee-jerk reactive from the client and then you as an architect quickly get put into just providing a service or a commodity and then it's that race to the bottom in in fees and if you get caught up in that that's just very very difficult um do, how do you guys like to develop relationships with local authorities or any other types of of clients before they've got projects ready if you like is that is that something that you you actively engage in or yeah i think if i if we've probably got several answers to that but i think if i kick off um i think most of our strongest relationships develop from some initial working relationships from those first couple of projects where we gained a relationship of trust with certain officers or, or project managers and um and they've moved and we've sort of gone gone with them and i think that, that's been really helpful but i think it's then we've got to know other people in new organisations or we, uh, you know, I think they're sort of going to see people, going for coffees, uh, going for a few lunches, 
really trying to understand the individuals uh, on a more human basis has been really important. Um, partly because it, if you're going to do a project together, you need to really understand each other. I think what Tim's saying is you need to encourage your clients to move as much as possible <laughs> and take you with them. I think I think that's the sort of organic way that we've developed that, you know, I mean, there there is a nice thing with local authorities that people do tend to move every couple of years and, and then they do <laughs> tend to take you with them when they go. But I think the kind of less organic, more, I guess, slightly structured way that we've been working to start those conversations and again, for us to identify the right clients that we want to be working with in the last few years um, has been through we've started giving seminars. So um, we now have a series of seminars that we give to local authorities. We start off, the first one we did was the small site seminar, wasn't it? Um, which was really interesting. Harry put it together and you've given it to quite a few authorities. I've done it to a few. And it's interesting because it was a lot of knowledge that internally we kind of didn't think twice about the fact we had because we'd been just doing this for a decade. And then small sites, when the small sites allocation started coming up for local authorities, suddenly everyone was talking about small sites. And we were sitting there going, well, we know tons about this. Um, and actually a lot of it is really kind of just fairly basic practical advice. So we put together a seminar and it was kind of way more successful than we expected it mm, to be because, yeah. you know, we just go to local authorities and say, look, no skin off our nose, but we've got an hour free. Do you want us to come in, talk to your development team, talk to your planning team, just give this seminar? Um, and it was remarkably successful and it's been a really good way to start the conversation, but also um, for us to identify, well, who, who are the ambitious authorities? Who are the ones who are saying, well, actually, we haven't designed or developed in 20 or 30, 30 years, but we, we want to and we want to learn and we want to figure out how to do it. And more recently, um, on the back of our experience with a couple of projects, um, Tim and a couple of our senior architects have been giving seminars on Passive House and our experience of Passive House. Um, and again, it's just been a really useful way of identifying you know, who's ambitious out there? Who wants to do this? Who wants to kind of put their head above the parapet and say, OK, well, we need to deliver housing, but we want to do a bit more than that. And But it's also developing, you said it yourself, Rian, that the, developing the seminar, um, sorry, developing the conversation. Uh, and and that, is, that is really important. So, you know, the, a lot of our authority clients, they, they want this information. It's actually really useful to them. And we can you know, provide some of that for, for, for their offices. And that becomes a conversation that, that then is really valuable and then could potentially develop into a, you know, working relationship. What I found quite interesting about those seminars as well is that we've often given them, as Melissa said, to a combination of the development team, procurement team, planning team, regeneration team. And within the local authority, these departments are often siloed. So they're often yeah. working towards the same goal but often not really getting around the table and talking about how they're going to achieve it. So um, uh, given these seminars to people, I've, I've been to a couple where people have been sort of introducing each other to each other at the end of the meeting, going like, oh, you're so-and-so in, in development team. I've been emailing you. And, you know, actually they're getting conversations going within the local authority about how they're going to meet these objectives. And you know, a lot of them have got very ambitious housing targets imposed mm -hmm. by the GLA, don't really quite know how to do it. And so I think it's a really powerful sort of soft marketing strategy, particularly yeah. if, if you've got a portfolio, that's great. But I don't think you necessarily need a portfolio to be able to, I mean, we, we treat it like a bit of research. We've done 10 years of small sites projects. We took the time to reflect on them, um, analyze them, understand them, and pull out some key data. You know, how, how much does it cost per square meter? What are the sort of red flags about sites? How have we, you know, in Thorac, for example, how have we gone about analysing their portfolio of sites and identifying the, the best opportunities, looking at the whole piece holistically? So I think, um, and, and that's, as Melissa says, it's been really well received. Uh, it's a much better way to um, market yourself and, and get that conversation going, as you were saying, rather than just picking up the phone and just saying, like, I want to come and show you my portfolio. I, and I think that's very interesting what you said as well there is that actually this could be something that you could do irrespective of a portfolio of work, um, actually just kind of going in and, and starting to provide value for, uh, for for potential local authority clients just by demonstrating expertise and just stirring the pot in terms of getting a conversation running. 
Well, I know, I know some practices, some some fledgling practices who have just literally walked the streets, identifying small sites and and creating a sort of database of small sites that mm. they then taken to the GLA, the local authority, and said, let's have a conversation about you know these opportunities that we've identified. They've almost like started doing the local authority's job for them, but then giving them that sort of data as a starting point to to build that conversation, to build that relationship. Yeah, that's ma it's massively valuable. Um, in terms of, you know, actually putting together bids and proposals and, you know, I, I know and we, we've spoken in the past about this, that this can be an, an incredibly costly outlay for the business itself. Um, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, significant sums of money and time allocated to creating a proposal that may or may not come to fr fruition. Now, for obviously, for larger practices, this this practice of, of winning work like that becomes slightly easier, I guess, or we like to think it does. But and certainly for smaller practices, maybe this this becomes prohibitive. But how have you managed to balance and what have been some of the lessons and challenges that you've overcome with the the the, the kind of in resource intensive outlay of putting together bids and proposals well i uh, probably like most practices um we just used to see opportunities come up do they look interesting do they not look interesting let's let's beard or not beard and then a few years ago um i took some time out and i analyzed a year's worth of bids that we had undertaken and I looked at the resource and the outcomes and our success rate and so on and the amount of money we were spending on bids was astronomical I'd, I'd never analyzed it before and it was terrifying and I we, we put this sort of amount of money up on the screen and I, I can't remember how much it was like 250,000 pounds or something it was a huge amount of money and we we're like what could we do with that money we, we could we could go and do development we could invest in a company, we could invest in people, we could do research. You know, there are so many other things that we could do with that money. How many, how many lunches could we buy for people? How many, how, many, how many rounds of drinks? How many, you know, we could build a pavilion somewhere and just put our name on it. And there are so many things that you could do. Um, but, it, but it opened my eyes to the fact that we needed to be much more selective about what we bid on and, and the, the projects that we selected to bid on. So that, that we, and we've already talked to a certain extent about that sort of process of selection. But then beyond that, we're also, I think, very streamlined now in the office about how we go about bids. So we have a sort of database of all the questions we've ever answered, and they're all tabulated into, you know, CDM questions, quality control questions, et cetera, sustainability, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you get a bid in, you can go to this database and you go, okay, what have we answered on sustainability before? Oh, that question looks similar. You grab that question. No, I don't know if I should do this. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you put it in and you start that as a, as a starting point and then you, and you hone that answer to more focus on the question or the client or whatever. But it, it gives you, um, I mean, that, that's a really good starting point. It also allows us to, you know, we can tabulate, going back to what we were saying before about, you know, um, how many risks do we take with bids and, and, and what type of bids do we go for? You know, quite often, frankly, it can come down to, yeah, looking at the questions and being, okay, is this, you know, is this going to be a really time intensive bid with very little reward or with a very small chance of winning it? Or actually, is this a, an invited competition with maybe only three or four of our peers? And frankly, the questions are case studies or questions that we've answered before in other bids and we can put it together quite quickly. You know, I mean, if it's, put it this way, if it's an unknown client um, for a small scale project where they're asking for a disproportionate amount of design for the bid right. and a huge amount of additional work, that's going to really focus our minds on whether or not it's the right bid for us to go for at that time. Sounds but, like one we just did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I think, that didn't I think, come off too well. <laughs> but I think I think also a lot of the local authority officers. Um, well, there's a couple of authorities we're going back to at the moment just to sort of um, talk about the the processes um, and the amount of money it is costing um, consultants to bid. And I think it's it's news to a lot of people's ears. And I think you know a, a lot of officers are trying to do the right thing in in procuring mm. in the correct manner. 
but um, they're not always appreciating actually how much time and effort and cost is involved in that. And I think sometimes people have been quite surprised when we've been honest about the costs to us and, and quite shocked. And I think this is where Harry's saying we're hopefully seeing a slight move back towards a slightly simplified process with some clients um, because people do appreciate that, you know, that if we're having to spend X thousands of pounds on a bid, where's that money coming from? It's Well, it's coming from the current projects that we have in the office and the fees that have been agreed on those projects for those clients. And we really should be using all of that fee to resource that project for the greater good of the project and, and, and that client. But actually, we're having to siphon off some of that resourcing to, to do the next bid. And it's in nobody's interest to do that. Well, we, yeah. And when you look at the fact that it's not just us, it's like, you know, we, we're for most of the sort of juicy work in housing in London, we tend to be up against five or six of our peers that we know personally, that we respect professionally, who are all doing good work. We've all got good output. And there's almost a question of, like, well, why are you bothering? You know, yes, there's a kind of, there's a need for a transparency in the procurement process and there's a need for a sort of competitive edge to these things. But actually, you know, of those five or six peers that we're constantly up against, we respect them, we value them, we think they're good designers. Actually, maybe if they have this one and we get the next one, you know, because those fees, you know, at the end of the day, they they just get fed back into what our overheads are as a practice. Mm -hmm. And then the fees, ultimately, the local authorities are, are paying. So, you know, kind of, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Like, if you're getting the 10 best housing firms in London to constantly compete against each other and spend tens of thousands of pounds at a time on bids, and then those same same 10 practices are basically having a monopoly on winning the jobs, then you're essentially just paying those 10 practices to do a whole load of abortive work yeah. each time, you know? Do you, do you guys ever collaborate with the with the other practices in London or kind of get together and you, if you know that who that they might be yeah. on, the, on the list, I think, I think if you like? I think that's a really important um, point. And uh, again, I think it's a, a trend sort of, that we've seen in the last few years in particular is that more and more clients don't want that sort of single voice in their master plan or scheme, whatever it is. They, they want to see, um, you know, a sort of variety of, of, of styles and ar themes and ar architects working on their projects. So I think more and more clients are, are looking for um, collaborations and a range of practices and I think that's being seen as a way of promoting smaller practices and, and a more diverse um, uh, group of practices as well so yeah I mean absolutely I mean we, we, we do it both ways so on some bids we're looking to collaborate with smaller practices um, but also ourselves we're seeing that as a, a stepping stone to larger schemes is to collaborate with either bigger master plan architects or indeed, uh, you know, similar sized um, practices like ourselves, um, where perhaps, you know, two or three of us might stand a chance against, you know, uh, one of the one of the really big practices. And, and one of the things actually we really enjoy about the collaboration, apart from the benefit to the client and the project, is the, is the, the critical friend aspect. And actually, uh, we've always found our peers to be very open in, and sharing, in sharing knowledge and expertise and, you know, not really not sort of, um, you know, not, not sort of hiding it or sort of keeping the IP to themselves. It's, it's always been a really constructive conversation that's to everybody's benefit. I mean, let's face it, like, you know, nobody gets into architecture, you know, you don't just do it for the money. You do, you do it because it's something you find fascinating and it's a passion. And most architects are thoroughly boring because we like to talk to other architects about architecture, you know, so actually collaborating with your peers is great and, and people do tend to be really open and you know there is always that kind of spirit of sharing and you know to mutual benefit um, and yeah like clients are seeing that more and more and I think the other thing is what we've had on a few projects with both private clients and local authorities is when they'll have two or three um, practices working on different projects we'll do kind of peer reviews which are also extremely useful it just just takes your head out of the box, out of the small space of your own project. Um, and again, that kind of critical friend role, I think, is extremely helpful. It's it, it helpful to do it for others, and it's really helpful to receive it as well. It, it, it reminds me of what Cabe used to be 
where we there was kind of like a you know more of a sort of formalized process of kind of peer reviewed crits and actually that becomes an incredibly valuable asset to the design yeah. as a whole yeah. and, to the, and to the client i mean i think something that's missing from frameworks actually is is more of that peer review so um whether it's local authority frameworks or or um housing association frameworks you know as melissa said you, you end up in a group of 10 practices who are all very very good at what they do and are on a rolling basis delivering projects for that organization over a you know five-year period or whatever it is um and there's not enough information exchange between you know within the framework itself there's not enough knowledge sharing um visiting each other's projects mm. peer reviewing you know pre-planning whatever it is i think i think that is something that would be uh hugely beneficial and i'd like to see more of Although actually, on that note, one of the things that we, all three of us do, and that I think is um, really useful in that respect in the industry, is taking part in design review panels. Um, you know, I think it's really fascinating in terms of, like, on the most basic level, just frankly, seeing how your peers present, you know, and seeing how different practices go about the process of presenting to a DRP. Um, I think it's a really interesting way of having conversations about projects, particularly maybe projects that aren't in your sphere, you know, talking about sort of non-resi projects or um, or projects at a different scale for a different type of client to what we normally do. Um, and it's also a really interesting way of yeah, meeting other people um, from across the sector and starting more interesting conversations. You know, I met a lot of people through doing design review panels that then you meet them at events and you think actually, you know, let's pick up that conversation, you know, that we started or we seem to have a lot in common in terms of our approach to design when we were on that DRP together. Is there some other way that we could collaborate? Um, it's interesting when we're looking at this kind of how, how procurement process works in local authorities and your experience with it and you're starting to um, put forward suggestions of how to make it better if you were to kind of take a 30,000 view foot view if you like of the whole procurement process as a as a whole what other types of changes do you think would be highly beneficial both to the architecture team and to the client and the end product oh, I think we're all sort of thinking about the answer to that but uh, just simplifying the process I think is the key thing just make it much shorter I think so one thing I might say about frameworks is um, to get onto a framework, you need to answer all sorts of questions about uh, health and safety, um, your management processes, your social value and so on. Mm -hmm. And that's all understandable. But I think once you've done that once to get onto the framework, you shouldn't need to be asked to produce similar answers to similar questions to actually get a project from the framework. I think we'd like to see that second stage in the process certainly much, much simpler. Either there's a rotation where each architect on the framework, each one gets the next project kind of thing without any further process because they've all been judged to be suitable and, you know, the kinds of firm that the client wants to work with. Um, or, or, or it's just very much simpler where, you know, none of those questions have to be re-answered and you just um, produce a very simple, maybe written uh, summary of uh, your first ideas for the project. Because being architects, we're all very passionate about things and you get a, a brief through and they ask for your first ideas and people pile in and do photorealistic CGIs and this is all beautiful and... But we're all doing each other a disservice. We're all ratcheting up the pressure. It would be much better if um, the, the submission just required a page of A4 on your most lucid, perceptive thoughts on how you can be the best person for, for the project. So, so really simplifying that second stage. I think something also that we've seen um, quite a lot is a practice will do a feasibility study and, and, and uh, undertake a bid and or be appointed to a feasibility study. And then that same project will be rebid uh, either to, um, you know, a panel of people that will, in will include that same architect. And sometimes that's a stitch up and the person that did the feasibility study in the first place is going to win the job. And um, that's fine. Uh, that's not fine, but it, but OK, if that's how it is, then that's how it is. Just just give them the job. Don't Don't ask everyone to bid again. Or, um, or it's not a stitch up and everyone's going to spend a huge amount of money trying to win this job. Um, 
I, I think if, if, a, if an entirely competent, you know, decent architect is doing a feasibility study on a project and has done a good job, they should just simply be reappointed to, to continue that work. And we shouldn't be wasting everyone's time um, and energy and effort um, rebidding that project. Yeah, I think there's, there's also a real issue, um, again, and, you know, things like what Harry was saying about the seminars he gave, where you suddenly find that the procurement team have never met the development team, you know, <laughs> and you might be working with a development team and a local authority and they, they might be saying all the right things and, like, you know, they may have a lot of experience in development and say that you are a feasibility architect, we think you're great, but unfortunately we're, we're working with one hand tied behind our backs because we've got this kind of sort of faceless entity that is a procurement team over here that, you know, just, you know kind of come down from on high and tell tell us how it has to be done and that just that just doesn't seem practical or sensible and it doesn't seem ultimately like it's giving anyone best value for money or yeah. um sort of prioritizing quality of what's being delivered you know i think i think there's more bodies within local authorities that need to be talking to each other and you know working in a coherent fashion i think um I think one of the things also that is a bit of a shame is one of the things that came out of the changing in the structure, you know, you used to get um, HDA funding um, much uh, to a much larger extent on affordable housing than you do now. And when they changed that, they also brought in these rules around um, local authorities being able to develop wholly owned companies. And the whole idea of the wholly owned company um, was it was a kind of arm's length organisation that could have its own financial structure separate to the council and therefore it could act more like a commercial entity. But in fact, what's happened with most of those companies as they've been created is that their kind of structure and um, their procurement systems have been designed to mirror that of the local authority. Right. So although they're technically a wholly owned company that is separate and therefore shouldn't be, um, shouldn't have to follow the same procurement requirements as the local authority because because their policies are just mirrored. They do anyway. So, you know, all the benefits that they should have of being a commercial entity are completely lost, you know, and, and things like that where they could just be a bit more fleet-footed, mm. um, operate a little bit more like the private sector in terms of being able to establish re relationships with designers and consultants and once they've established them and they know they've got a track record just carry on doing good work as quickly as they want instead they're having to just operate exactly as, the same as their kind of mirror image in in the local authority and i, I think that's a real m missed opportunity mm. but it's also an opportunity it's, it's a missed opportunity to promote those innovative young practices like we were, well, we, we still are still are innovative. We're just not young, <laughs> like we were in in two thousand and four. You know, you, you're missing that opportunity because because the processes, as we as we talked about, are so unwieldy that it automatically precludes, precludes yeah the, the younger practices from from bidding. Well, it, it, it's I mean, it's quite fascinating. You know, you you kind of would expect that the whole purpose of a framework is for efficiency. And for it to, you know, you've done a pre-qualification of all these, of all practices, and then it's, it sounds like there's a, so much sort of repetition that's, that's being involved. And, and what, are the, what are the kind of cycles, the life cycles like about getting onto those frameworks in the first place? And how easy is it to get onto a, a framework? And, you know, are younger small practices able to get onto frameworks, say, you know, if, if Bell Phillips, for example, kind of, shouldered them in if you like or we kind of as a as a collaboration does that kind of thing happen um it's getting harder and harder well it's getting i think i mean the first thing you've got to, the first hurdle you've got to overcome is your pi um value so a lot of local uh, local authorities will set that at, at 10 million which straight away precludes a whole raft of young practices mm. from um, even being considered having said that um, quite a lot of local authorities and housing associations will have a sort of a major projects panel and a small projects panel. So they'll often open the door um, through that to, to smaller and younger practices. And then sometimes they'll select um, or, or they'll ask practices to collaborate between the frameworks. Um, but um, I mean, life cycles are generally three to four years um, for most frameworks. 
So it, it's... Um, they do sometimes extend them, don't they? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, in general, you know, it is quite quite an effort and, and generally quite an investment to get onto them, but it, it can be very good. I mean, we were on the first um, ADUP framework, ADUP um, TFL framework. That was the, the Mayor's um, GLA framework, which actually turned out to be very, very good for us. Um, they they selected, I think, about 10 or 12 um, practices across a range of scales. And it, it happened that there was an awful lot of work um, coming through that, and quite a lot of the big practices were very busy and, and weren't so interested. So, so we actually um, uh, did very well out of that, in fact, yeah. in terms of workload. One thing about frameworks also is, I mean, that we've been talking about frameworks that you get onto, then you have to bid again to... For a, for a project. I mean, not all of the organisations operate like that. Some of the housing associations are, are not so much like that. Um, you know, you can get onto a framework thinking, oh, great, we're going to get some work out, uh, from, from the client, but you, you won't necessarily um, unless, you know, you, you, you do go and get to know them. So I think in addition to that legal process of getting on the framework, you do also need to go and see them and knock on the door and show your face and strike up those personal conversations and um, and. and that, that's a necessity. That's a really good point. I mean, there's no point in getting on a framework and then sitting in the office waiting for the phone to ring. You've got to get out is there right? and, and meet the people. Yeah. So, is it, so essentially the framework is the, the starting point, if you like, for developing The framework is just a kind of legal, the sort of legal process that allows them to even think about appointing you. And once you're on that, that sort of, it doesn't, you know, guarantee any work as such. Right. How, how well, I mean, th these are some, so I was just going to say, these are some of the sort of challenging issues about public sector work, but there's plenty of positives, which is why we're here and why we work in the, in the sector. How um, does it differ from, say, the work that you do in the private sector and the way that you bid for work there? And what, and what do you think are the two that things, and again... Uh... I mean, I think, interestingly, um, maybe it's partly because we're growing as a practice and um, growing in scale of the type of projects we're doing, but in the last few years, we've seen quite a few of the bids we've done in the private sector mirroring the kind of level of detail and complexity of, of the ones that we've done in the public sector. So in some ways, they, they don't differ that much. I guess the big difference is, and it's the same once you actually get the work, is um, whilst relationships count, if you do a really big meaty project in a local authority and it wins loads of awards and it does really well, when the next project and the next opportunity comes out to bid for, you're still back to square one in terms of, you know, having to go through the same process again. Whereas, obviously, in the private sector, you can do a bid and it can take tons of time and tons of resources and you have to do design work and you have to do all the other qualifying questions and things. But even if you come second place, you've still kind of stood up in front of the relevant people and shown what you're capable of. And after that, they can kind of turn around and say, OK, well, you didn't win that one, but here's another scheme that we're just going to appoint you on direct kind of thing. So in that respect, the private sector is, is in many ways easier because, um, you know, we can do an amazing project for a local authority and they can be like, we're so pleased with this and look at all these awards we've won and we're so pleased with the way you've done, but our hands are tied and we'd like you to bid for the next one, but you're going to be kind of back in the pool with everyone else. And I think that the shame of that is that nobody benefits from the continuous learning. So with the, with the private developer model there, you know, you, you get a project and, and it works very well and they may appoint you for a second and a third. Um, and everybody learned, everybody's worked together and you've learned lessons from the first project and apply them to the second and, and so on. And, you know, that, that process of learning together uh, is really valuable to a project and, and often the local authority processes don't, don't permit that. I mean, there will, when you're in the private sector, there will usually be a degree of pitching, stroke, uh, free work in the sense that, you know, you might get a, a call from someone saying, we're looking to buy a site, do you mind doing a, um, a sketch scheme? Um, and you can choose to do that or not choose to do that. But there's, there's often a degree of, um, you know, upfront investment to get that job. It's just, I, f I feel in general, and Melissa's right, that the bigger developers... Um, because perhaps they're becoming big organisations that are almost as big as sort of local authorities in terms of their sort of own internal bureaucracy are doing those sort of bigger procedures. But the smaller, light-footed developers, um, you know, it's much it's much easier to do a sort of bit of a back of a fag packet sketch for someone who's you know looking to buy a site. Um, and then, as Melissa says, you've, you've banked that goodwill 
and you know you know there's an ongoing relationship there's there's going to be at some point a project for you mm. whereas authorities you know you can keep plugging away without necessarily any sense that that project's ever going to arrive brilliant thank you i think to start concluding the conversation what will be really nice um is to uh, look at the question of why, why do you think it's important that architects work in the public sector or or mm. kind of continue with this kind of this kind of work i mean we know that it's it's, it's very challenging and that there's you know, difficulties and complexities with how work is procured um and perhaps this touches a little bit on the on the underlying mission of of bell phillips but overall what's what's the the benefit that we can can bring to that sector i think Oh, I was going to say, I mean, one of the things I think that, you know, I think in both the public and private sector, you get clients that really are thinking about the long term and they're thinking about, you know, the climate crisis in the future and, um, you know, where we're going to be in 50 years time and what's the legacy that we're leaving behind. So I think there's clients in both sectors, you know, that we're really passionate about working with. And I think, um we feel really strongly that it's why we get out of bed in the morning. But I think one of the things that maybe trumps with local authorities is actually, frankly, about where they own land and where they develop. You know, that I think we have spent nearly 20 odd years now um, doing projects in places that private developers don't own land, can't acquire land. But small interventions, be it, you know, 10 new houses or a 50 unit scheme or, or, you know, right up to kind of big master plans, massively change the lives of people whose lives otherwise would not be changed for the better in terms of way that, where they live. You know, and that is work you just can't even get hold of in the private sector because mm. that land's not owned in the private sector. So I think there's people in both the public and private sector who we feel really passionately align with us in terms of thoughts about how we want to grow as a practice and the type of buildings we want to do. But I think there will always, certainly for me, and I suspect for you two as well, be that passion and interest in the public sector about being able to build places where we really, really make a difference. Um, so the people whose lives really, you know, are marginalized by literally their physical environment around them. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> relating to that, um, we you know we really do get involved with lots of those communities. So we're working on housing estates, for example, where um, we really do need to get to know the people who live there because they'll be fundamentally affected by what we do or what we don't do. And for us, it's always been so important to hear people's life stories and understand. Uh, where they're coming from and where they're going. Um, and that kind of social aspect has been so informative to our work to try and ensure that the end result that we design is really responding to the to the social needs. And I think we wouldn't have that sharp end of the conversation uh, with certain projects um, in the private sector. For me, um, in the post-war era, I, I guess the councils were the largest house builders in the in the UK and um, it wasn't an abnormal situation to be living in a, a council-built um, home. That was, everyone lived in them. Um, somehow over the years, the term council housing became stigmatised and, you know, a sort of, it became the poor relation of, um, of owner-occupied housing. And I, I think what's interesting for me is since 2004, I think our practice and other practices have been endeavouring to change that perception and make council housing something to be proud of again. Um, and something that, as Melissa says, that really, really makes a difference to people's lives, really makes an impact. And I think for me right now, it's local authorities and councils who are driving innovation and change in the housing sector. It's, it's them, you know, they're invested, they're politically invested, they're invested as the long term uh, owner of, of homes and land. Um, and so it's them that's really investing in, in um, sustainable, the sustainable agenda in terms of quality, in terms of innovative housing types. So I think I'm, I'm just sort of excited to be part of that sort of wave of architects that's working in that sector. Brilliant. Love it. And, and finally, what's the rest of 2022 got planned for you guys? <laughs> 
A lot more work. Loads of, ha- <laughs> loads of housing. Tons of housing. <laughs> Uh, we've got, I mean, we've, um, we've done, we've got a lot of new stuff coming. We've, you know, I think it's been interesting. We've gone to see a lot of clients recently that we haven't seen for a couple of years. And, and I think people are really shocked because we've sort of in the background been really slowly, quietly changing the scale of work we do. I think it's really fascinating. We're doing a lot more master planning now, you know, kind of 500,000, 1500 unit schemes. Um, which for us is really fascinating because whilst the infill is really, really um, brilliant in terms of kind of like that incremental change, um, when you get to the scale of master planning, there's just different conversations as designers you're having. So we're, we're doing more of that. And then weirdly, as ever in our practice, we're kind of working at two extremes of scale. So we've got um, several of our pavilions are going to be finishing up this year. Some our first, is it? Can we call it carbon negative? I think you can, depending on whether you <laughs> agree that timber sequesters carbon or not. Uh, yeah, hopefully our first carbon negative building will be completed and we've got another community that will be going on site this year. So again, it's always that thing of the diversity and the practice of working at very different scales and um, with different uh, sort of specialisms. Yeah. And I think if I add to that, the... Um as well as forging ahead with housing, we're keen to diversify our portfolio a little bit more. And the Mitchell Building, which you mentioned, uh, our first education project, has been really great to work on. And we would love to work on more education. And that also fits quite well with the um, sort of social agenda that we have from, from our housing portfolio in some respects. But, but equally, we would love to work on uh, work, workplace projects. Um, and other public projects and you know who knows I think it's it's interesting for us all to have new challenges and cross fertilize our housing work with all sorts of other things so we're keen to um, to spread our wings further and like everyone we're, we're addressing the sustainable agenda and the climate crisis and we've got our first two passive house schemes um, underway we've got plenty of net zero carbon schemes but um, like everyone um, we're sort of starting to shift our focus um, not so much onto the operational carbon but seeing how we can figure out the conundrum of embodied carbon as well so that's quite a quite a challenge yeah and I guess I guess the other thing is we're sort of we're coming up to our 20 year anniversary and sort of coming full circle back to what we're talking about with how Harry and Tim started the practice Um, and you were you were asking um, you know how did you know why did we decide to go into housing and Harry was saying well partly it's you know it was just luck of the draw that that was the right project at the right time. I think the nice thing about coming up to 20 years and the work we've done is actually we do have a little bit, a little bit more leeway now to decide where we want to go. Mm. And, you know, and I think that the 20 years is, is creating a lot of conversations in the office about actually who are we, where do we want to go from here? What are we passionate about? What are we really proud of? And, you know, how can we be a little bit more the masters of our own destiny going forward? Love it. So hopefully watch this space. (laughs) Excellent. Brilliant. Tim, Melissa, Harry, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. That has been an absolutely fascinating deep dive into your expertise around procurement in the public sector, um, your overview and understanding of how it operates, and also just really inspirational um, to hear about a practice with such strong civic responsibility and doing such great work. So thank you so much uh, once again. And um, Thank you. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. (laughs) and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfillment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information if you enjoyed today's show please head on over to itunes and leave us a review i read every single one Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to 
smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.